Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheila Pfeiffer, and like many of you here, I'm honored to have um, my piece in the wonderful book that we're all celebrating here today. But it's also my honor to introduce our next presenter, Mary Colwell. As you just heard, Mary is a writer and a producer and a speaker on the relationship between humanity and the natural world and how faith intersects these areas. Her books are intriguingly hands-on and personal, while yet conveying compelling scientific data about the dire state of our planet. Mary's passion for nature has led her to trek the John Muir Trail in California's Sierra Nevada mountains, and most recently, to cover 500 miles on foot from Ireland to the east coast of England researching the fast disappearing curlew. She is someone who quite literally walks the walk. When I began to read Mary's latest book about the endangered Eurasian, cur the endangered Eurasian curlew, Curlew Moon, I was reminded of a line from the American poet Sidney Lanier. Oh, like to the greatness of God, is the greatness within the range of the marshes, the liberal marshes of Glynn. Mary Colwell, also an expert on marshes, will help us to appreciate how crucial not only liberal marshes, but indeed all the earth is to all of us. There will be no visions or vocations if we do not heed the warnings in Laudato Si and writings like Mary's. So let's listen to Mary tell us about Laudato Si, hearing the cry of the earth. Thank you, Sheila. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me today, Tina. What a joy to be here. And um, I absolutely love the poet Robert Frost. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of him. And uh, one of his poem that you'll all know, um, Two Roads Diverged Into a Yellow Wood. Am I seeing lots of nodding faces here? Yes. Um, the road less traveled. I took the road less traveled, and that has made all the difference. And I'm sure that's a mantra for everybody in this room. And I actually also think I'd like to claim a little bit of Robert Frost. I know he was American, but that, that first line, uh, Two Roads Diverged Into a Yellow Wood, a Yellow Wood. And I think that's because he used to come to Gloucestershire in the West Country. No, he did. And uh, there was a wood in Gloucestershire, and he used to come in the springtime. And what's in the wood in springtime? But the daffodils. So I think that we in the West Country could say that Robert Frost is a bit of a Wurzel Gummidge as well as a poet laureate from America. And he is my hero. Uh, well, one of them. There's quite a few. And... Um, what have I got on here? Okay, and I'll go on to the next one. So, but Robert Frost said something absolutely beautiful. He said, a poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a love sickness. What lovely poetry is that? It begins as a lump in the throat, something hugely emotional. But also it can be a sense of wrong, something that's not right with this. With whatever it is, there's something not right. A sense of homesickness, of wanting to go back to where you feel at home and secure. And a love sickness, that yearning for something that you love. And I think Robert Frost it, it captured there, captured the sense of what poetry is. And for me, Laudato Si was a poem to the world. It, I can't tell you the number of environmental meetings I sit in. And I never come away with a sense of poetry. Not ever. So, in Laudato Si, the entire material universe speaks of God's love, his boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. What? And he's writing about the environment. Uh, uh, there's four words in there I have never heard in any environmental meetings. Love, affection, God, Caress. Never. And in fact, as often as I get a chance, 
and even when I'm not really supposed to have a chance, I stand up and say, please, please, environmental world, can you only use words that are used in poems? Because actually, love of the earth is all about love, isn't it? It's all about emotion. It's all about our emotional response to what's behind us, to what's around us, to what we're part of. And this love of, of the natural world is really common, actually, much more common than we think. I know it doesn't look like in, in action that the Catholic Church does an awful lot for the natural world, but actually there's, there's a lot of really good stuff written there. So, Laudato Si, God has written a precious book whose letters are of the multitude of created things present in the universe. A precious book written by creatures. Actually, I was looking at this picture behind me and I was thinking, where are all the precious creatures? I mean, they're funny looking birds up there. But um, <laughs> they're angels, they're not birds. Um, but we're rich sparse on creatures there, aren't we? Which is a bit sad, really. And the Canadian bishops rightly pointed out, from the panoramic vistas to the tiniest living form, nature is a constant source of awe and wonder. It is also a continuing revelation of the divine. Do we really, really take those words on board? Is it really a revelation of the divine? from the tiniest living form to the greatest vistas. Can I ask you, do you know who said, he who can no long, longer stand wrapped in awe and wonder is as good as dead? Do you know who said that? Albert Einstein. Isn't it true? If you can no longer look at this planet and your heart leaps, I don't know where we have to go because it really should leap every time we see something out in nature, and just, wow. So the Canadian bishops asked us to look at all the variety and to hold it in awe and wonder. And then he said, the bishops of Japan, they had a really good thought as well. This is wonderful. This, to sense each creature singing the hymn of its existence is to live joyfully in God's love and hope. For the believer to contemplate creation is to hear a message, to listen to a paradoxical and silent voice. Wow, what beautiful words are these? I mean, they are truly beautiful words. And the, the first bit of this, that, that the things of this earth live and sing joyfully, remind me of another of my great heroes, who's John Muir, the Amer I, I like Americans, the American environmentalist and um, wilderness explorer who wrote beautifully about that. If you've not ever come across the writings of John Muir, may I please urge you to do so. He was a devout Christian, but he saw joy in nature and managed to go from his heart to his hand in a way and express it in a way that I find almost uh, unmatched. And so when Laudato Si came out, and I could do billions of slides on the beautiful poetry of Laudato Si, it was just beautiful because it asked us to contemplate and to live and to celebrate the creatures on this earth and to know that they mean something. And Karma de Grey, who is a, as a theologian in the UK, I was speaking to her not long after the data C came out, and she said, isn't it great? She said, so the first time I can walk down a street in Bristol and know the pigeons mean something. <laughs> isn't that a lovely way to express it? And so they do. They make, I love pigeons. They're one of my favorite creatures. They make me laugh the whole time. And then there was this passage. So we take it further, not just awe and wonder and love and all that kind of stuff. We take it further. Since all create, creatures are related to each other, each of their value must be recognized with affection and admiration. And all we created beings need each other. What a beautiful statement. That could have been written by St. Francis, couldn't it? that kinship, that relational sense we have with the things around us, brother, son, sister, moon. I can't imagine how revolutionary St. Francis must have been when he called a fish his brother or a cicada his sister. They must have thought he was bonkers because that just wasn't the way we looked at the natural world then. And you know, it still isn't. Despite all the evidence that we have now, Despite all the, the genetics that we know, 98% of us is identical to a great ape. 50% of us is identical to a cabbage. 
So, <laughs> which may not be quite so surprising in some cases. <laughs> um, that we all are interrelated. What an amazing thing, and yet we still find it hard to accept that. It's a very difficult thing to, to truly understand. St. Francis understood it. Pope Francis understands it. And I think that's wonderful. And then he goes on again, and this bit literally took my breath away when I read it. Each region has a responsibility in the care of this family, so it should make a thorough inventory of species it houses, with a view to developing programs and strategies of protection, taking care with particular attention to species in danger of extinction. I'm not sure how many people have read and reread that passage in the Dato Sea, but wow, Pope Francis is asking us to go out and do field work. Field work. Not just to sit and pray and feel nice things about it. To go and do something. I have never come across that before in any of the Catholic teaching, any of the writings that I've come across. Some beautiful words, but urging us to go out and do something was very, very different. Now, there are no prizes because both Sheila and Tina stole my thunder there uh, for saying what my favourite bird is. Um, but I reckon if we went round the room and asked you all, oh, what's your favourite creature? I think that we'd probably get quite a few different answers. Tina, what's yours? Kingfisher. A kingfisher. Anybody else? Eagle. A what? Eagle. An eagle, absolutely. Anybody else? Octopus, excellent choice. A monarch, oh, and for good reasons for that one. A giraffe? A dove. A dove. Oh, look, how amazing. Just so, so many things. And they mean something to us, don't they? The natural world means something in a way that the human world doesn't touch us in exactly the same way. And so this absolutely amazingly wonderful bird does something to me. It's called for the, and I know you're all very, very good at the Latin names of birds, so anybody want to tell me what it is? <laughs> oh, you must have forgotten. It's Numenius Aquata. Numenius Aquata. Numenius means new moon. Aquata, shaped like an archer's bow. Both of them refer to the shape of its bill. Numenius Aquata, the Eurasian curlew. I can't tell you why I love this bird. I, abs I mean, what is the not to love about that bird? It is so beautiful, isn't it? And... I didn't put it in my PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to play you its song. So just for one second, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to go to somewhere on a spring morning. For those of you who are not from the UK or across Europe, sort of use your imagination a bit. And, um, and think of a spring morning on a moor or a marsh and listen to the curlew. haunting sound and if you hear that if you're on your own in a meadow or on a mountain I can't tell you it does something to you the, the curlew has um, two, two tubes for, in its throat I call bird to do, we have one they have two and the curlew uses two tubes a bit like two trombones and it mixes the major and minor keys and so when, we, when it sings we don't know whether we're joyful or whether we're sad so it confuses us which is really lovely so the curlew is highly endangered. And let me just give you a couple of horrendous statistics. This is not a miserable talk. I promised Tina I wouldn't do a miserable talk. But let me give you a couple of horrendous statistics. In Ireland, Southern Ireland, in the 1980s, there were between five and 10,000 breeding pairs of curlews nesting on the bogs, on the mountain slopes, on their beautiful lush meadows throughout Southern Ireland. Between five and 10,000. Last year, there were 125 pairs left. That is a 99% decline. That's in just since the 80s. In Wales, there were 3,000 in the 80s. There are probably around about 200 now. In the whole of southern England, about 200 pairs of curlews left breeding. We are literally wiping them off the face of the earth. And that joyful sound and that beautiful looking bird is leaving us. It is leaving us, and it will leave us unless we do something. 
There's no doubt about that. In Ireland, there's probably about seven years left as a breathing bird in Ireland. That's on our watch, guys. That's on our watch. So, armed with Laudato Sea and a renewed sense of purpose and uh, uh, being told to go and do something about it, I set off on the 500-mile walk, which Sheila mentioned, and I set off from the west coast of Ireland and I walked through Ireland and I walked through Wales and I walked through England. And I talked to everybody I could talk to who knew about curlews. I talked to poets and artists and farmers and bird watchers and people who'd never heard of them before. And uh, it was fascinating to go and find out what's happening. And so when I came back, very disturbed by what I'd seen in many, many places, I set about thinking, well, you know, surely all the big bird watching organizations are on this. Surely they are. Surely they are doing something. Well, they weren't doing very much, or if they were, it was a bit patchy, to be honest. And so I went about and uh, organized four national conferences on the curlew. And I remember people saying, what? Are you sure? They said, um, you know, aren't you doing it through the RSPB or, you know, Wildlife Trust or something? But no, I didn't. I did it on my own, and I did it neutral so that anybody and everybody could come to these conferences. I wanted people who wouldn't normally sit down and have a cup of coffee together to come and sit around a table and work out what we're going to do about this bird. There's huge divisions in the conservation world. I mean, real hatred. Don't think it's all nice and green and cuddly out there. It really isn't. So people who go shooting and people who are anti-shooting both see themselves as conservationists, and they hate each other. They really do. But anyway, the curlew, because everybody loves curlews, and in 500 miles, I never met one person that wanted to kill a curlew. They, it was a safe space to come together. It was a safe thing to coalesce around and work out, leaving all the division behind, people who would not talk to each other, talk to each other. So there we are. Oh, no, not that one. There. That was the first uh, conference, top uh, for you, top right, um, in Southern Ireland. Uh, that was in November 2016. In February 2017, top right, left, no top right for you, is um, Slimbridge in Gloucestershire, the Southern England Conference. Bottom left is the um, All Wales Curlew Conference, and bottom right, just last Thursday, the All Scottish Curlew Conference. And each one of those conferences has produced something concrete. It's not just sitting around wringing our hands and thinking, isn't this terrible? They've all produced strategies and plans and have putting into action as we speak things to try and turn it around. Now, I have no idea whether we'll save the Eurasian curlew. I have no idea. I, I don't know. In Ireland, it's a one hell of a battle to turn it around. There's huge forces against them, but at least we've tried. And David Attenborough, I went to sit and listen to him talking in St. Paul's Cathedral, and someone said to him, don't you ever get really despondent about the state of the natural world? And he said, as long as I can look into the eyes of my grandchildren and I can honestly say I did what I could, then I'll die happy. So we're doing what we can, and I don't know whether we'll survive, well, they survive, and probably not for me to know. But the thing is, what made me laugh was all the way, oh, and I started World Curlew Day as well. And uh, do you know how you start a world day for something? You phone people up and you say, it's World Curlew Day on April <laughs> And people say, is it really? I didn't know that. That's fantastic. And I got my cousin, who's a graphics designer, to design a little logo, and now it's Will Curlew Day on April the 21st. Isn't that great? <laughs> Officially recognized by the UN, by the way. Great. <laughs> and so people said, you know, you've done this on your own. You've not done it with any organization. Like I did the John Muir Trail, I did it on my own. I didn't go with anybody. I tried to persuade Tina, but she wouldn't go with me. <laughs> Seriously, talk about a friend. And uh, anyway, it's all right, Tina, I've forgiven you. But I did it on my own. And people say, oh, but, you know, the forces are too great. You'll fall off a cliff. You'll, you know, people won't take any notice of you, blah, blah, negative, ne negative. But of course, it's not like that, is it? It's not like that. And this very famous cave painting shows that women have just gone and done it from ever, really. So there's a female uh, cave woman dragging a mammoth she's just slaughtered. 
and really annoying the caveman, who's saying, look, I'm the hunter, you're the gatherer. And she's saying, I know, but it was standing on what I wanted to gather. So I think that speaks for all of us, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it just? What a great... Take that with you. That, take that image with you when people say, you, sh you know, I don't think that's... You should be... Oh, oh, dear, I don't know. You get a lot of that. So, so Franc Saint Francis, Pope Francis, World Youth Day, 2013, I ask you, he said, to be revolutionaries. I ask you to swim against the tide. Have the courage to swim against the tide. Have the courage to swim. And that's everybody in this room is having the courage to swim against the tide. And he put it even more beautifully, even more poetically in Laudato Si. He said, an authentic humanity, someone living a true and authentic life, calling for a new synthesis, seems to dwell in the midst of our technological culture almost unnoticed, like a mist seeping gently under a closed door. Beautiful. Like a mist seeping gently under a closed door. So that's what I think we're all called to be, revolutionaries. And of course you're all revolutionaries. Men and women in this room are revolutionary. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But I want to ask you what kind of revolutionary you are. And I want to give you just two, before I finish, two little images, really. Uh, a kind of a sidestep from everything we've been listening to. So this is Claude Debussy. And uh, he was mainly, uh, uh, he died at the age of, what's that, 56, is it? Is that my maths right? So quite young. And... Um, but he was a revolutionary, and he was a beautiful revolutionary. When he was composing in the 19th century, there was a very, I'm not a musician, this is just what I've heard from a professor who seems to know what he's talking about, that there was a very set way of doing, certain, of doing music, that you played chords and you finished the chords off in a certain way, that you didn't leave things hanging, that you had a sort of exp a sentence that came to a full stop. And Claude Debussy said, you know, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Let, let, I think I'm going to do it my way. And he produced music of such beauty, such beauty. He produced impressionist music. And this, like, um, so little bit. How do I play that? Do I just, um, just click and it'll play? if you can't hear it, but it's a little piece of music that represents light playing on waves. Nobody would written a piece of music about light playing on waves, and they certainly hadn't done it like that. So that was, um, he, he, he didn't finish any chords off. He just let things go. He broke the rules. Anyway, if you can imagine, it's a very beautiful piece of, like Claire de la Lune, you know, the, uh, the beautiful music of Debussy. Very soft, impressionist and utterly revolutionary. It horrified the people at the time, the <coughs> classical critics at the time, horrified them. They, uh, they didn't like what he was doing at all. And so, he, but he was a, what I would call a beautiful revolutionary. Soft, gentle, mist under the door type revolutionary. And he said some really lovely things. He said, I love music passionately. And he said it was because the classical music, it smelled more of a lamp than the sun. I like that. Isn't that a lovely way to put things? And so maybe that's what we need to do. Bring some freshness, some beauty. Break a few of the rules, you know. And then this other guy who lived roughly about the same time, lived a lot longer than Debussy, Schoenberg, was a very different sort of revolutionary. He broke all the rules as well. But he really didn't break them in a beautiful way. He broke them in a way that challenged you right to your core. You're going to listen to something really different and you're going to ask questions about what I'm doing. And he wrote, when the world was poised between elation and ruin, between the end of an epoch and the birth of a modern era, 20th century with all its torments and its discoveries to come. And he wrote really challenging music. And we're not going to be able to hear it either. But do you know Schoenberg? discordant, non-harmonic, angry, vicious sort of music, not vicious, it's totally the wrong word, challenging sort of music. 
And so he, was, he sort of needled away at the music critics of the time and said, I'm going to make you think about the world in a different way. So maybe we're both those things. Maybe we're beautiful revolutionaries like Debussy, or we're more of a sort of challenging revolutionaries like Schoenberg. And, and maybe we're both at the same time. Maybe we're sometimes one and sometimes the other. But from what we've heard today, everybody is a revolutionary of some kind, that mist seeping under the door. And in my, uh, the book, in, in, the ch in the chapter in the book, the, the article that I wrote in the book, I describe my journey, my environmental journey, as a sort of very much on the outside of any of the interests of the Catholic Church, really, right up until recently. There are lots of nice words about the environment, very little action. And I describe my journey as a bit like a mountain path where the mist keeps closing over, a bit like a whiteout. If you've ever been up a mountain, you'll know what a whiteout and how frightening that can be that suddenly you don't know where you're going. But when the mist does clear and you can see where you're going and you can see the vistas, it's so, so fantastic. But to be honest, absolutely most of the time I feel like that. I have no idea where I'm going. I don't even know whether I'm on a path, whether I'm being completely mad, and I'm just going on. But somehow you can't help but keep going on, can you? Even if you don't know you're gonna get anywhere, you can't help but keep going on. And so this is the very end of what I wrote. So I will keep doing what I feel is right and keep looking for the path ahead. I always take with me the words at the end of the Mass. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I can't tell you how often that's comforted me. That instruction is my guide along this mountain track that still appears and disappears with infuriating randomness, but is undoubtedly there. And I suspect I share with other women in this book the sense that there is no option but to keep on going on, peacefully and determinedly walking our own paths and bringing our own stories and insight, trusting that they will contribute to a more holistic and inclusive future. It's been an inspiring day and thank you for listening. <laughs>